Hello. All right. Uh, so, hello. Uh, my name is Peter Spear. I'm, uh, I just wanted to sort of welcome you guys to the first event of the Future Hudson series. Uh, I was going to tell you a little bit about what Future Hudson is, um, and who is involved, and uh, and what to expect coming forward. Uh, Future Hudson is a series of events. There's going to be six total. Um, the third Saturday of the month, every month until September at four o'clock, there'll be an event here. Um, on some topic uh, related to the city of Hudson. And uh, it is, uh, I've been calling it sort of resident driven and all volunteer. Everybody involved, including all our panelists, have donated their time and their expertise. But I wanted you to kind of get a look at the people who've been involved in putting it together. So if the people like Angeline um, Chandler, Clark Wyman, Betsy Grandcow, um, John Rosenthal, Larry Bound, uh, Tamar Adler's not here, uh, Tanya Kumar's not here, Trista Schroeder helped us out, um, so if I missed anybody. Um, and then the other piece of news I wanted to give you was that uh, Walter Chatham <coughs> has invited his friend uh, James Howard Kunstler to come and give a talk um, Thursday, May 30th here at the library. <coughs> he sent me the title um, <laughs> the other day. It's, the title is, The American Small Town is Where It's At. Let's get it right. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's the news. I'm going to hand it over to John Rosenthal. Today we've got um, Joe Chegna from Patterns uh, for Progress, um, Kaya Kuhl from the Hudson Valley Initiative, and Dan Dioka from Innerborough, who are going to drop some wisdom for us. So thank you very much. So thank you. I'm not going to drone on too long here, but I just want to talk, uh, you know, since this is an event about urban planning, um, I want to just sort of broadly speak about that and root it a little bit in historical context and talk a little bit about Hudson. Um, so, you know, Future Hudson hopes that throughout the series of these events that we sort of, um, everyone will leave each one and through its entirety we'll kind of get uh, that's the notion of a sense of place, what, what it means to live in Hudson, what, what it means to be active here and, and uh, get a sense of, of community. Um, so, you know, without further ado, the, the idea of urban planning is old. We recognize things about cities and towns in the past that seem familiar. Grids, paved streets, commercial arteries and public markets, sanitation systems, etc. The Romans planned their cities and towns as a reflection of Rome. They exported the street grid throughout the empire as a means of creating a shared urban fabric, a sense of Rome. Urban space was idealized, excuse me. Urban space was idealized to reflect originally the ethos of the Roman Republic, and after the collapse of the Republic, the urban fabric transformed to reflect the cults of power rooted in the empire. Um, in the sake of the city of Hudson, Hudson sort of formed as a commercial endeavor by a group of Quaker uh, whalemen from Nantucket uh, who sought to escape um, the travails that happened to the Nantucket whaling fleet during the American Revolution. They were neutral and they sought a uh, safe harbor uh, well up the Hudson River. They settled Hudson and created a, a grid that's a neoclassical grid much like the Romans uh, and laid out this sort of plat that gives a sense of uh, stability um, uh, a notion that you know throughout the ages they'll be able to they'll have a form to, to city growth, but mainly it was a commercial space. Um, so the function of playing for public space is typically lodged in the realm of local government. But in the, in the last decades, we've seen the rise of community-based planning to challenge the orthodoxy of top-down planning schemes, with a goal to inclusivity of diverse voices and a desire to have urban spaces reflect the complexion and desires of specific localities holistically and to correct adverse consequences of early iterations of planning. Um, we could see that here if we walk out. Uh, we look at Bliss Towers and um, the history of this uh, Hudson certainly was um, shaped by uh, urban renewal, which gutted a great side of a, a great swath of the north side of this community and, and 
change the, uh, the urban fabric in a very uh, violent way. So, <clears throat> uh, in the modern era, we see the rise of the need for park space. This is a new sort of concept in urban planning. Uh, for general recreation and public health, it's a new facet uh, in the concept of urban space. The need for parks contends with commercial and residential spaces within the contemporary urban framework. And we can see how green spaces informs those other spheres of urban life in the competition for space. Um, another focus in, urban, in urban, contemporary urban planning is for historical preservation, the idea that uh, older structures, which hitherto, hitherto had no, well, let's not say no value, but because there was no larger frame to control what could be saved and what wasn't, um, now we have a, a very vibrant dialogue about saving and repurposing structures, and Hudson certainly is a good example of that. Um, as cities in denser urban environments lure people back from the suburbs and farther flung ex-urban developments after years of urban flight centered around the automobile and commuting, we see the rise of con concepts of pedestrian walkability along with alternative transportation modes to reduce the footprint of the car and the urban landscape. Uh, and finally, we have certainly the climate crisis, which is forcing demands of weather resiliency, low carbon impact, and other new concerns into the planning framework. So, although you know, looking into the past, we see lots of concepts that sort of seem eternal and we recognize them now in terms of how we think about what our common space, our common urban space is. Um, there's always these sort of new iterations and, and new concepts. So uh, without further ado, we'll move along to the panel here and sort of get into the broadly the discussion of urban planning and hopefully root it back to Hudson. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Joe Tyka, and so I, I guess this, the style of, of, of this afternoon is to get through our slides in somewhere between seven and ten minutes. The presentation I'm about to go through typically takes me about 30 minutes or 35, so I'm going to go really fast. You're going to see a lot of data, but I'm going to try my hardest to get through it very quickly. Um, and so before my timer starts, just a real quick um, introduction. Uh, again, my name is Joe Chike. I work for an organization called Hudson Valley Pattern for Progress. We're located at Newburgh in Orange County, New York, and we cover nine counties uh, throughout the Hudson Valley. We define the Hudson Valley as everything from Columbia and Green all the way down the river to Westchester, Rockland, and out as far as Sullivan County. For purposes of today's conversation, I'm going to go through a number of topics, um, setting the data and some information really at the 50,000 foot level and then slowly drilling down into Hudson. And um, for today, we're going to concentrate on seven counties as the Hudson Valley. I'm excluding Westchester and Rockland County, um, which is a very, very different area of the Hudson Valley. And it's really part of the New York metropolitan area as opposed to many of the other counties. So. Here we go. I already said that, so I gained some time. Next slide. <laughs> Population. So I don't know if everybody can see the numbers, uh, but in Columbia County, back in 2000, there was about 63,000 people. Uh, as of 2017, there was just over 61. So there's a, there's a change. So we had a 2.6% drop over the last 17 years. Not a good thing to see. Uh, typically, you want to see at least level growth, if not more growth. Um, and you can see some of the other counties throughout the Hudson Valley, they have grown. As a region, we've gone up 58,000 people over the last 17 years. However, if you start to look at the period of time over the last seven years, 2010 to 2017, you'll still see Columbia County dropping in population, but all of a sudden, you'll start to see some more red in, that, in the column of number change and percentage change as some of the other uh, counties have lost population, and as a region over the last seven years, we've lost almost 4,000 people. A population pyramid. Typically, a population pyramid you want to see look exactly like a pyramid. So the, the pyramid on top represents what it is in 2000, meaning the youngest at the bottom, the oldest at the top. As you can see when you go to 2017, it's not staying as a pyramid. You can see those bubbles sort of coming out. So that's a graphic representation of what a population pyramid is and how it has changed just over the last 17 years. 
Another big change that we're seeing demographically in the Hudson Valley and in very a lot of the, of the smaller communities is the change in the Hispanic population. It has been, been increasing over the last 17 years in every single county. Um, and the non-Hispanic population, except for the county of Orange, has been decreasing. Orange County can be explained by one little village called the village of Curious Joel. It is an ultra-orthodox community. Um, it has doubled in size over the last 20 years. And with its exponential growth, it's looking to get to about 80,000, which will take over about a third of Orange County. Another whole entire story. Demographic change by age cohort, again, over the last 17 years. You see a lot of red in the first column and in the third column. The first column represents 0 to 19. This is generation Z. The next generation up, millennials, over that 17-year period, in each of the counties has actually grown. That's a good thing, because that is really the starting um, of your of a of a work of a workforce. It's their you know kids are coming out of college. They're starting their first jobs. They're getting their feet wet. They're starting families. Hopefully, the next generation, 35 to 49, you'll see again a lot of red. And then as we jump to 50 to 64 and 65 um, and above, you'll see all sorts of big positive numbers. What's happening? We have an aging community and we're having less kids born. That's the overall theme of that slide. At the very end, what we like to call it is the silver tsunami. <laughs> <laughs> From, now, Cornell University, a uh, program for applied demographics, they do projections and one of their, what they, what they do is they, they forecast by age cohort what's going to happen. So from now until about 2040, you'll see red everywhere, except in one column, 65 and over. Again, the silver tsunami strikes. All the other red is not good. It's not a healthy community to have all of that negative on the bottom, because again, there's nothing to support that population pyramid at the top. Highlights in Columbia County, the city of Hudson, has had the largest decline of all communities in Columbia County. Um, it's dropped 14%. The largest increase in the, is in the town of Claremont. Now, I went to Germantown Central, graduated back in 84, had a class of 48 kids. I think today is a little smaller than that. Um, but I don't know what's going on in Claremont. Maybe it's something in the water. But there is you know, 300 people more. So there's some, there's some good growth going on in that little rural community. Uh, the city of, of Hudson, as many of you probably know, had a peak year back in 1930 with just over 12,000 people. Today's population is estimated at about 6,700, essentially half. School enrollment. So I talked about the declining population in the, young, in the younger generations. If you look at the school enrollment from 2000 all the way through 18, you'll see a lot of red. And specifically over the last couple of years, it's dropped dramatically. 18,000 kids over the last 17 years in school. Um, in Orange County, there's only been six districts with growth. In Putnam and Sullivan, there, were one, there was one district. In Sullivan County, it happened to be a district called Roscoe. It, it had two people more. They graduated about 12 kids. So it's out in the hinterlands. School enrollment right here in Columbia County by district, again, very, very red. Um, 2,725 was the drop over the last 17 years. Their peak years um, by school district were, was uh, essentially back in 2001 and 03, 04 for Taconic Hills. One little bit of an, out, uh, of an outlier, uh, New Lebanon, again, the other end of the county from Claremont, but it's interesting. Um, it's, it's going up by 21%. Uh, it's predicted to go up by 21% over the next uh, 10 or 11 years. County business patterns. So if we look at the slide very quickly, you'll see Columbia County all the way over on the left in 2016 had about 1,783 firms. 
if you look at the very top, you'll see these two percentages, which stands for firm, the percentage of firms with 10 or less employees. So it's about 70, what is it, about 78%. And if you add in 10 to 19, you're somewhere around 90% of the firms in, in all of these regions um, have less than 20. So they're small businesses. But it's interesting when you look at economic development activities, they concentrate their activities and incentives on the large corporations. And they give pilots, they give all of these things. But the main business in all of these counties, small business, local mom and pop stores. Uh, average annual wages by industry in Columbia County. I circled some of the more important ones only because, and I'm saying more important is because there are a lot of uh, people that are living, uh, that are working in these trades. Retail trade, 2,688 people. Um, the average uh, um, annual salary there is about 30 grand. Food and beverage, average salary is about 23. General food or general merchandise stores, 21. Transportation warehousing, about 33. Just keep that in mind. That's an annual wage. How do you live on those numbers? Columbia County, again, by industry, uh, health care and social assistance, 4,359 jobs, which represents about a quarter of all jobs. Um, and the average wage in nursing or residential care facilities is about 36. Arts and entertainment, 27. Food service, 20. Um, and then local government jumps up to about 42 feet. But these people that are earning those salaries are people you see every day that you count on. The wages are low. Where do they live? How can they live? How can they get to work? How can they have transportation? How can they have good, good uh, daycare? How can they buy food for themselves? The, the wages are a little bit of out, out of whack in, in an economy that really concentrates on tourism. So, affordable home ownership. In Columbia County, uh, the median priced home is about $239,000. You need to earn about $85,000 a year to purchase that home. Um, and that is assuming um, actually a, a very low down payment of 5% if you can find a loan with, with, the, uh, with only 5% down. And the reason I show this again is if you look at what you need to earn, two people, two wage earners, have to earn about $20 an hour. That's a far cry from some of the wages that I just showed you on the other slide. The, uh, the uh, median income in Columbia County is about 60,000. So that is 85, it's a lot higher than the median. Rental housing, it's what we call out of reach. These are the out of reach numbers for each county based on a two bedroom fair market rent um, uh, unit in each, in each county. And this represents the monthly gap after what people pay as opposed to what they should pay. Affordable, housing is affordable when you pay no more than 30% of your gross income towards rent or home ownership. And these folks are paying much, much greater than 30%. That's why you see the red on the bottom. Has anybody ever heard of Alice? ALICE stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. This is a study done by United Way. They just completed the third one. They did one in 2012, 2014, and 2016. And it represents the people that are living above poverty, but still struggling and not enough, they're not earning enough to buy a home and rent a decent apartment. In Columbia County, you can see that 28.5% of the overall population meets that guideline of being Alice. They are struggling. They don't have enough to make ends meet, but they earn too much for any kind of subsidy and government assistance. Cost burden. This is about a half an hour presentation actually onto its own, but very, very quickly. I just mentioned before that you have to earn, um, you have to pay no more than 30% of your gross income towards housing to live in an affordable situation. In Columbia County, 22% of the population pays more than 30%. 19% pays more than 50%, which means they are severely cost burdened. 
and that's on the rental side. When you jump into the city of Hudson, drilling down a little deeper, you'll see that about 25% is unaffordable and about 17% are severely cost burdened. When you look at the home ownership, it's pretty much the same pattern. You'll see severely uh, cost burden for home ownership at the county level is 11%, but here in the city of Hudson, it's about, it's almost 20%. Thank you. Did I go over my time? I don't know. <laughs> Can we just talk about that? That's way more interesting, I, I fear, than what I'm going to present. That was super fascinating. Um, so, um, uh, I, so I actually live in Tivoli, so I'm, a, I'm an upstater, so I'm, I, I guess I'm bucking the trend because I'm in that, what, 35 to 49 group who is actually moving here from some, somewhere else. Um, but in any case, so I, uh, I, I live in Tivoli. I moved here uh, three years ago uh, or so. Um, I don't actually know Hudson so well, so I feel a little bit um, sheepish talking about it. So I'm not, I'm not going, to, <laughs> not going to. Hopefully, it'll come up in the conversation. Instead, what I want to do is talk about um, an urban planning book um, that I wrote uh, with uh, my office that may or may not have relevance, I think, to Hudson's future. Uh, I think, in, in a way, it's maybe a, a, a presents a case study in what not to do, <laughs> uh, urban planning wise. Um, so, um, oh, is there like a clicker? Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, just to get a little bit of background, so this is a, a book uh, called The Arsenal of Exclusion and Inclusion, and I, I wrote it uh, with my office, Interborough Partners. Um, so you see here, we, we focus on inclusive uh, architecture, urban planning, and design. So we're a, a, a professional office. Uh, these are my two partners, Georgina and Tobias, um, on the right. And uh, uh, quick, uh, just a quick snapshot of the kinds of things we do. We, we design public spaces. We um, do a lot of neighborhood and regional plans. Um, and uh, we do a lot of community engagement. And we, we uh, are always looking for interesting ways to get people to talk to us, uh, most recently by um, taking over an ice cream truck and paying, giving people ice cream to give us input about a neighborhood in Detroit. Um, and we also do a lot of education, right? A lot of our outreach is actually around kind of empowering people with the kind of knowledge they need to make good decisions about, about urban planning. Uh, so whether it's a game about zoning or a newspaper or an activity that allows you to rethink the right of way of some streets or a comic book. Um, that's the kind of stuff that we do. We also do a lot of research, though. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we'll skip over this pretty quickly. But uh, the biggest research project we've done to date is this book. Um, and that's uh, called The Arsenal of Exclusion and Inclusion. And um, I, I, I thought I would actually introduce it by, by, by talking about what I'm going to call some cultural artifacts. Um, uh, so uh, this is the first one is called the Bollard, and we're going, to, we're going to start by actually going for a little drive. So we're in Baltimore, where I used to live, um, and we're heading west on 35th Street. And so I'm trying to get, I'm trying to go straight. I'm in my car, I'm trying to go straight. Um, behind me is Waverly, where the city's like a grid, and ahead of me is a neighborhood called Oakenshaw where suddenly the grid stops and where 35th Street becomes something different called Southway. And unfortunately for me, I was trying to visit a friend there, Openshaw, uh, streets blocked off with bollards and a curb. Uh, so I'm going to make a right. You can chart my progress here. Uh, and then I'm going to try to make a left. But the next time I tr can try to make a left into Openshaw, uh, there's no bollards this time, but there's that curb again. And there's a big do not enter sign. Um, so I can keep going. Every time I try to make a left into Oakenshaw from Waverly, I'm going to be thwarted by something. Do not enter sign, uh, going north still, fake gates, which you can't see so well, make it look like a gated community. Um, so, okay, so I can't get from Waverly to Guilford or Oakenshaw. Uh, big deal, right? But if we look at it another way, if we, if we look at what we can't see, namely the demographics dividing these two communities, we see that this physical divide is also a demographic one. So here, is Waverly, here is Oakenshaw. Um, you can't quite read the slide, but uh, Oakenshaw is 96% white, 75% of the people have a bachelor's degree. Uh, Waverly is 86% African American, 16% have a bachelor's degree. The, me the, the median income is about $50,000 less on this side than that side. All right, we're going to look at another cultural artifact, also from Baltimore. Baltimore is really rich with these things, by the way. Um, this one is the fence. Um, so uh, we're gonna, we're, now we're out on the, the city-county line, 
Uh, on the border between Baltimore and the suburb of Rosedale sits a 60-acre pile of rubble, which is enclosed by a 8-foot tall uh, spiked wrought iron fence. Now, until the year 2000, that pile of rubble was uh, Hollander Ridge. This is a 1,000-unit public housing development built in 1976. Um, it was 100% African American when it was demolished on July 9, 2000. So, okay, so here's the situation. This is Hollander Ridge, back when it was built, so it was like this tower surrounded by a courtyard. Here is Rosedale, and this dotted line is the city-county line, all right, uh, between Baltimore and Rosedale. Um, and so the fence is a product of a 1994 uh, HUD pilot pro project to try to seek solutions for crime in HUD-supported public housing. But what they did was they decided to just basically fence in all the people who lived in public housing. Um, and uh, here's a quote from uh, someone who's very critical of this. The Baltimore H Housing Authority in building this fence is sending a, a, a powerful message that having poor minority people in your neighborhood means crime, drugs, and badly maintained housing. And the best thing to do about it is to put existing problem people on reservations and keep any such additional persons out. Nonetheless, the fence was built. Uh, here, here you see it, and here you're looking at it from from the Rosedale side. Uh, it was built at a cost of 1.7 million, demolished, and then Hollander Ridge was demolished two years later, although the fence is still there. You can still see it. Um, okay, now we're gonna look at one more, oh, we actually got two more cultural artifacts. This one called the Shed. So now we're actually gonna go to Detroit, also rich with cultural artifacts of exclusion. Um, and we're actually also on the on a city-county line. This is Alter Road, which separates Detroit on the left from Gross Point on the right. Very similar demographic divide, very white, very wealthy on the right side, uh, not so much on the left side. Um, and uh, so uh, the thing I want to uh, focus on is that recently the suburb here has been coming up with all kinds of cheeky ways of blocking access from Detroit into um, uh, Gross Point, right? Uh, so for example, they dump their snow right in the middle of the street, so you just can't drive here, um, which is crazy. Uh, so the one that uh, I actually want to focus on is this one. It's a, it's a, call, it's a festival market shed. Um, this is what it looks like if you live in Detroit and you're trying to get out of Detroit. You can't because you're blocked by this thing. And this is what it looks like on the other side if you're in Gross Point. Um, and it, it's, um, so the, it, it's actually a, far, a farmer's market and it was part of a larger vision of creating a more walkable community that would appeal to young white collar professionals which sounds okay, uh, but when they built it, they used it as a fortification, right? They built it right in the middle of the street. Um, and, uh, oh, interestingly, I, I went and visited recently, and it actually turned into this. I guess they got them out of trouble, and they said, okay, well, what if we still narrowed the street, and instead of, like, a farmer's market, we'll put this crazy sculpture here. So I, these artifacts, to me, are interesting. I think, like the, like the bollards on, in Baltimore, or the Hollander Ridge fence, this shed, or even this piece of art is a cultural artifact. It's a manifestation of a very deep demographic and social divide. Um, one more for you. Uh, this one uh, is a wall uh, while we're still in Detroit. Uh, this is called the Burwood Wall. Uh, pretty unremarkable artifact itself until you understand why it's there. So in the early 1940s, uh, a developer built an all-white middle-class subdivision on the border of an African, African American neighborhood. Um, and because it fell within what's called red line territory, maybe some of you know about the history of redlining, um, the Federal Housing Administration would not give this developer a, uh, uh, a mortgage, right? Or wouldn't give them mortgage insurance. And so the developer said, well, what if I built this big, uh, eight, you know, this big concrete wall separating my white subdivision from the African American subdivision? And guess what? The FHA said, that's great. Um, here's your money. Uh, so, uh, anyway, so these, these, these are banal artifacts, right? They're, they're kind of, but they're Rosetta Stones, uh, whose markings reveal a series of conflicting attitudes and analogous rules and regulations about who, ha who has the right to be where, uh, when, and for how long. They're very real, very present reminders that cities may exist to bring people together, uh, but cities are also pretty good at keeping people apart. Um, so that's what this book is about. Um, these are artifacts in, uh, this book. Um, there's 157 more. Actually, Kai uh, contributed an essay. Kai and I actually share an office space in New York, so it's funny to see Kai. Um, 
So um, it's an encyclopedia of these different artifacts, or what we call weapons, that are used by architects, planners, policymakers, developers, real estate brokers, activists, and other urban actors in the United States to wage the ongoing war between NIMBY, not in my backyard, and WIMBY, welcome in my backyard. Um, and very broadly, the book looks at two spheres. Uh, so it looks at um, housing, right, uh, represented here. That is, who gets to live where? Uh, and where are the weapons that exclude people from living in this community or that community? And exclusion in public space, that is, who gets to hang out where? Uh, and uh, what are the weapons that exclude people from hanging out in this or that space? So um, I'm just about out of time, but you know, a lot of this ends up being about race, right? Because if you're talking about housing exclusion, um, you can't tell a story about uh, uh, the cities in the United States without talking about race. Um, so um, some of you might know about restrictive covenants. These were put into deeds of homes. They're kind of a smoking gun uh, of, of segregation. Um, so, uh, and they, 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 a lot of houses to this day have these, these deeds in them that say things like, none of this property shall be sold, leased, or rented to any person or persons other than of the Caucasian race, nor shall any person or persons other than that of Caucasian race use or occupy said tract. So th this was actually legal until uh, 1948, actually, and not, not made fully illegal until 1968, uh, Fair Housing Act. Um, Anyway, but a lot of the book doesn't talk about history. It talks about ways that even though we have this Fair Housing Act, we have all these kind of pieces of legislation in, in place that prevent us from this kind of very explicit um, kind of racism. Um, the book really talks a lot about um, kind of post-Fair Housing Act um, uh, weapons of, of, of exclusion. Um, so we could talk about a blood relative, rel uh, relative ordinance where um, after Katrina, basically, this community outside of New Orleans passed a blood, it was an all-white community, and they passed a blood relative ordinance which said that the only people who, that you can only rent houses to people to whom you're related by blood, and if, you're, if it's an all-white community, guess what, <laughs> right? So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, a, a, it's something uh, that, a way that racism doesn't, doesn't go away, and this kind of exclusionary impulse doesn't go away, it just kind of takes on new uh, different and more clever forms. So that, I've been talking for over 10 minutes, so I'm going to stop. But there's like lots more uh, of that um, to talk about. Um, but anyway, like I said, it's a kind of it's a kind of example of maybe what 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 not what not to do in terms of urban planning. I, I'm, I am an urban planner. You might be wondering why, given that um, so much of this book is about the terrible things that have been done in the name of urban planning. There's also lots of good stuff, and I believe very strongly in um, in good planning. And hopefully, we can have a good conversation about that um, after Kaya talks. Thank you, Ben. I feel compelled to mention that my tiny contribution in this book is actually one of the few uh, positive uh, examples or inclusionary examples about immigrant recruitment in order to revitalize a neighborhood. Um, oh yeah. So I, I thought. Um, what I would like to share um, to kind of uh, instigate conversation here um, in the title of this afternoon is what makes Hudson a great city. I, I want to step back and ask who makes city, um, great or not. Um, and I want to use, um, I want to show a few slides and, and use my own experience as an urban planner um, to, to sort of just share this with you and see if some of my own lessons learned in my um, professional experience as a planner might apply to Hudson, and that's really for you to judge. Um, so, I, uh, which one is the, oh, this one's mine, okay. So, um, a little bit of my biographies. In 2008, I um, left my job as an urban designer at the Department of City Planning in New York City, um, and I had spent the previous five years um, working with primarily communities in Harlem and Washington Heights, uh, mostly communities of color, spend a lot of time walking the streets there, talking to people, um, and a lot of time at community meetings, community board meetings. And I was, wasn't always welcome there, and most, most of the time the first question that people asked me as sort of the representative of the city was, uh, why wasn't I invited to this meeting? Which was kind of puzzling to me, because obviously they were there, and so I was just trying to say, you're welcome, we're so glad you're here, leave us your contact information, please come again. And that happened over and over again. And then um, often conversations sort of followed to um, 
the city should do this, the city should do that. Um, why doesn't the city you know, involve the residents more, clean our sidewalks, build affordable housing? It was sort of a constant sort of questioning of what the city should be doing. Um, and, and understandably so, in, the, in that context, I was the representative of the city. But it made me ask myself, who really is the city? Um, and so while it wasn't so much these questions and meetings that led me to leave this job, maybe more sort of the daily routine of a bureaucrat, that in 2008, when I decided I want to try something new, I picked a really bad time. Um, the recession, so um, you know, I left my job without a new one, and then it was really hard to find a new one. So, um, oops, sorry. Quick. Um, so I started renting a um, desk in the space where both of us still work, um, a little over ten years ago, and just started sort of doing projects on my own, um, reflecting on these questions that I heard, and really reflecting on what I thought these questions meant, which was a lack of agency or a perception of the lack of agency that people felt in um, how to create their own city or how to participate in the development and the creation of their own city. And so um, as I began sort of uh, thinking about this and doing projects, and um, Dan may remember this, I, I just started using an email address um, that was inspired by this image, um, but also inspired by these questions. Sort of reflecting back on people, um, he, he said, oh, what a great name for a planning firm. I'm like, I'm not a planning firm. I'm just the person who, um, you know, has this email address. And it's, it's, I see it more as a challenge or an invitation or a prompt to people to think about who really is the city or how can you participate in the making of city. Um, and I see my role as someone who has, as an architect and urban planner, um, a skill set to offer to help facilitate this. And so I'll show you a few projects um, how, where I've done that and, and who then really was this agent or who took on agency um, in making parts of the city. The first one is kind of a self-experiment in phytoremediation. This is a, um, a way of cleaning up contaminated soil in a community garden in the Bronx where um, I had set out to write a guidebook of how to do that. Um, but I wasn't really sure if it would work, so parallel to writing the guidebook, um, I worked with the farmers in the South Bronx to test it out. Um, it was also sort of this educational um, landscape that it would explain to people what these plants are doing and how the, the sunflowers can clean up lead in the soil. Um, and was sort of a space to learn about the process, was a space for us to learn about the process too, because we weren't sure how, what, if someone can actually do this on your own, if you can do this on your own in your backyard. Um, quickly, a second example is just a one day experiment. It was meant to be a design workshop for a park in Staten Island for a predominantly Mexican community. What it really was is a day to bring people to this park that no one really knew existed, or those who knew it existed thought um, it wasn't really accessible because some parks planner 10 years ago had told them that they cannot play on the lawn. Um, this is kind of a very good example. That <laughs> isn't even a physical barrier, but this rumor that you cannot play in this park you kind of lived on. And so this day literally just you know brought the community back into their park together with sort of d discussing a vision and then creating a group called Friends of Favorite Park that is now um, improving the park. Um, and then a, another example is um, a hiking map, a hiking trail in northern Manhattan that connects um, the several parks from Central Park all the way to the cloisters. Um, and this here, the agents, if you will, for making the city or making this trail was a group of people that just wanted to re um, connect to their parks in their neighborhood again and needed sort of this framework of a map and, and making this trail visible together with um, a series of walks um, on National Trail Day or Hiking Day um, every year. They walk the entire stretch um, together and workshops where um, people then, walk, you know, we, we've had one where someone explained all the trees in the parks to us. Um, where, where people meet for exercises, and that, that culminated in sort of also showing the many beautiful highlights uh, in northern Manhattan in these parks. Um, and so all of these are sort of reminders that we, you know, many people have agency in making the city. It's not always just city government. And of course, 
these projects take many different forms and are small and big. I want to show one more what, uh, that I think is really important um, in sort of widening the view of who can participate and, and help make a city a vibrant place. This is a workshop we did um, in 2017 in East Berlin um, where we worked uh, with refugees, newcomers to Berlin who had been um, uh, who had arrived in Berlin in 2015, and this uh, district in East Berlin was the uh, you know, predominantly this you know Soviet type uh, prefab housing, um, and this is the district where the majority or the largest number of refugees were settled. Um, what you see on the left is actually the headquarters of the former East German um, secret service, the Stasi. Um, and this also happened to be a shelter for about, I think, 2,000 refugees the year that we came to do the workshop. And it was the home of our workshop. And so it's um, kind of, it, it's, it's a very strange neighborhood it, uh, because of its built fabric. And we asked, we did an inventory of the neighborhood, we also did an inventory of people. We wanted to know what are your talents, what are your skills, what are resources that you can bring to this neighborhood. And we didn't only ask this the newcomers, we asked everyone um, during this workshop, um, how can we activate these spaces by um, seeing what you already brought to the place. Um, and so this turned into a process where we developed scenarios that were both big visions for this place. So this, this massive headquarters is, is uh, part, in parts museum, but uh, most of it is empty. And so a lot of people saw a great vision for this to be a cultural center. But this is, of course, a big vision. What we also wanted to do is to see how these talents that are now in this neighborhood can activate the place right away. And so by building simple furniture to um, and organizing outdoor concerts, which is one of the things that people told us, we, we're musicians, we would love to play more here, um, is, is sort of one way of bringing um, the agency of people who were housed in this neighborhood um, into um, and, and activate and activate the spaces there. Um, and then the uh, second story is um, of this person here leaning against the wall, Ahmad, who um, participated in the workshop and helped sort of frame um, these stories and the uh, and, and also the end product. He had taught himself how to repair bicycles. Um, and so uh, during the workshop together, we built a mobile bicycle repair unit that he now uses to both repair the bikes for kids in the shelter, but also travels around the neighborhood to repair bicycles um, for everyone in the neighborhood. He himself sees this as a way of just meeting people and learning German through the conversations and the interactions. Um, but it's also a, a contribution to a neighborhood that doesn't have a bike repair shop. Um, and so I'm here also because I'm the director of the Hudson Valley Initiative at Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. And so for the past year, I've been doing a lot of projects in the Hudson Valley and, and bring some of these the, this ethos of facilitating agency into these projects. And I just want to show a few, one of which many of you in the room probably know because I've been on this camera every two months, I think. Um, so our goal um, at, uh, the, at GSAP at Columbia is to bring design education really outside of the walls of this beautiful building, uh, Avery Hall um, in Manhattan and bring it into the communities that we learn from and where we work, but also to bring um, our skills and, and our, our design talents uh, back to the communities. Um, one project that we're doing currently in Newburgh, here are some images um, of is the, uh, a guidebook really to help residents understand how they can activate city-owned vacant lots into neighborhood amenities, neighborhood parks. So what you're seeing here is um, a first sort of session that we did last fall where we just asked people on one of these lots, um, what, what would you like to see here? And then we, we um, gathered some high school students um, who helped us build it. And, and this really sort of leans, uh, you know, takes a lot from the previous project in Berlin that the idea is to create both a big vision but also a pilot that helps us test these ideas as we're doing them and forms the bigger vision. It also does, it means that you don't have to wait for 20 years until change happens in the city. You can start with small steps and, and uh, grow incrementally. Um, and then 
Uh, second project that many here are very familiar with are these uh, what were called design actions for Oakdale Park. Uh, and here the vision was really that um, it's many small visions that um, now Friends of Oakdale Park are in the process of uh, realizing. And one goal was to um, not sort of come up with one giant rendering and plan um, and maybe a phasing plan, but have all these ideas that can happen independent of each other. Um, like for instance, um, here's sort of a, a, a sketch of what um, a renovated entrance to Oakdale Park could look like um, if it's pedestrianized. Um, that you know, any of these ideas could happen first or last, uh, depending on interest, support, funding. Um, here's another image of um, you know, you don't see Glenwood Boulevard anymore here behind the lush uh, greenery that would sort of shield the lake a little bit and provide more opportunity to access it. Um, so this is really just um, kind of to give you an idea of why um, I think involving all of you in how to make uh, cities um, is just as important as involving sort of urban planners like us or um, city governments and agencies um, to have conversations together and really develop agency. Um, and I'd love to talk about this more with all of you. Great. So thank you for opening up the conversation to the room. I'll just sort of try to start by generating conversation amongst us and then you know, we'll do like a symposium as people feel the need to chime in, we'll, we'll you know, raise hands, we'll try to accommodate. Um, thank you all. That was great. You guys did a very amphetamine-inspired uh, presentation <laughs> and, uh, of your in-depth knowledge. Um, so full disclosure for people who know the audience and for people who don't know, I'm on the city council here and it's a, um, there's a large, big focus amongst uh, uh, my fellow colleagues on the council and city government to um, revisit planning models here for the city, um, especially since, uh, as Joe pointed out, um, the county and the city itself has lost a, a, a large degree of population. At the same time, we have the sudden interest in Hudson as a tourist destination. There's a seemingly vibrant retail economy on Warren Street. Um, but since, you, since we've been talking a bit about community-based uh, planning, and that's a lot of your, you two in particular experience, um, I know from uh, personal sort of uh, understanding of how planning's happened here before in the past. A lot of it was top-down or outside-based, uh, you know, with the idea of the hierarchy of planning. You know, you think about a Robert Moses type or Baron von Hausmann, people come in with an idea and transform a community and then, you know, the consequences happen after that. Uh, so it's that interesting tension between this generative quality of going in with people, working and talking, versus the larger uh, uh, you know, concept of planning where you put an RFP out for a service-based firm that comes in and, and provides uh, some sort of thing that's supposed to slot into the community and often that's full of boilerplate about outcomes and economic development, etc. But uh, often not, that seems not to really work, um, although it seems to be a big driver in, in planning. So it'd be interesting to hear both your experiences in more detail as to how your community-based projects work, like the positives, the negatives, the tension. Yeah, just quick, I mean, I, I totally agree there's, a, there's definitely been a shift um, in how planning gets done and it's definitely, at least in my experience, it's been much more bottom-up and community-based. Um, and uh, for example, so my office, we respond to a lot of these RFPs, right, um, uh, around the country and it's been amazing just to watch over the last 10 years how much of them, just watch the language and <laughs> request for proposals. Uh, watch the language in them change. They all now require a lot of community engagement. They all require robust processes of engagement. They all want something beyond the six o'clock meeting at an auditorium. They want you to go to people. They want you to translate everything. And I mean, and it's great. It's a really, it's a really good thing. Um, one of the challenges though is, is, um, uh, is that uh, people sometimes are, nimbiest and racist and, and so listening to people sometimes frankly means people don't want things to change right and and it's it's a, it, we've been in situations and I'm sure you have too right where where you're you're the you're listening to community feedback and the feedback is 
we don't want anything to change. We don't want anything. We don't want growth. We just did a you know uh, citywide plan in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we heard two things. One, we need more affordability. Two, don't change anything. <laughs> and the, those things are at odds, right? And so there is a role for expertise. And I think we, we while I'm absolutely very, very bottom up and horizontal all the way. Um, I, I still uh, believe very strongly <laughs> in the expertise that, that planners have, and we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, there are just certain things we've learned, I think, over the course of um, our, you know, however long it's been working <laughs> as, as, as city planners. And um, so it's the, the trick is to, is to listen, but to also um, point out maybe some of the, the contradictions and what sometimes what people want. Um, and point out that sometimes there's trade-offs involved. If you want affordability, sometimes you need growth, right? Um, and it's one of the reasons why I think in the long view, uh, <coughs> education is really important, and I think that's why I showed one slide really quick of all these different things that we do to try to like, you know, um, empower people with knowledge about like how cities change and what, um, what some of these trade-offs are. Um, yeah, okay, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also important to remember that this is not a black or black and white conversation, right? It's not either top down or bottom up, and you know, very good planning processes are sort of a combination of both, and, and um, an interesting sort of mix of powers and agencies involved. I I, I like to remind uh, my students, for instance, and I think actually not many people know this, the High Line, which is one of the most celebrated urban design projects uh, recently in New York City, was such a process that you know, essentially was a bottom-up uh, approach or started as such, but where um, kind of community members organized really well and at some point, and this is sort of, this happened at the desk next to me, when, next to me when I was at city planning, that they were managing city agencies. They were, you know, co coordinating and cooperating with city agencies. So, so it isn't so much always, you know, it's not a fight against something when community members try to plan. It, it can often be much more of a, or ideally it's a collaboration between many different uh, stakeholders, players, and, and a lot of conversation, and it takes much longer than either process, if, you know, if either party would do it on their own. So it's, it's important to strike a balance. Uh, we do a lot of community engagement sessions, and we'll typically set it up for residents, we'll set it up for businesses, and we'll set it up for other community stakeholders. And then if, if timing permits, we then have a, a fourth uh, sort of a session where we intermix all of that. Um, and the other piece of the, of the balance that must be stricken between all of this is really hearing from, uh, from your local leaders in what can be done, what challenges and barriers are there, and how do you overcome that to meet the goals of, that, of, the, of the people that are living here and are running a business here and want to live here. So it's, it's all about striking the balance. <laughs> the youth expert. I, I think that's that's pretty fascinating and accurate. I mean, um, since Hudson is a chartered city, I think sometimes when you hear a city, it gives you a delusion of possibility. Then you think of the size of Hudson being 6,700 people, roughly. It's more like a village. Yet we have this historical memory of a, of a larger, more dense place where there was a different economy. Um, and also this sort of, uh, the, once you start reviving and making these beautiful old homes, it gives you the sense of, uh, of promise and place, but it sort of runs into conflict with, with the possible. And I think it's pretty interesting, since Joe, you, you grew up around here, that you could sort of speak to the change and also what you do for work. Um, you're definitely well aware of the economic reality, as you've shown. Um, because for me on the city council, when, you know, we have a very modest budget, and yet there are demands in the community for things like affordability and providing um, outcomes for people that really are just beyond what we could do fiscally or financially. So um, just be, uh, yeah, that conflict between the possible and what, what can be done and that tension is pretty fascinating. But uh, we could open up the floor to questions if people want to. I, I just did have a question. I want to hear a little more about the methodologies that you use when you know, uh, engaging with communities. Like, you get an RFP, for example, and they say we want uh, this 
outdoor space to be created, but we want what it's going to look like and what it's going to do to come to be generated, those ideas to be generated from the community. How do you kind of balance that in terms of the actual like methodology for generating those ideas? And, like, what do you ask people? Yeah. I mean, for, for us, I mean, uh, every project is different and we always have a different um, community engagement process for whatever project we're working on. So right now we're, we're, we're um, designing a, a natural playscape in St. Louis. It's like basically a big playground, big 20 acre playground with no playground equipment. It's all done out of landscape features and uh, things. And um, we did a robust community engagement thing and we basically um, just thought it'd be really fun to ask kids to um, make collages out of natural elements. So we made this kind of color forms activity and these kids made these like crazy things like that were, seem weird and amazing. And so we're just gonna build them. <laughs> so like it's just like well, really one-to-one -one thing, which you don't usually do in planning. Usually the, what you try to do in engagement is push back on people's assumptions and say, well, you don't really want a mall. You just want like a place to go and window shop, right? And they'll be like, yeah, of course. But in this case, we actually just said like, okay, Sure, like rocks on top of sticks with trees sticking out, you know, like, and so, and the idea there is that, like, well, kids can come and be like, that's mine, right? So they'll, they'll be more encouraged to, like, come to this space. So that's just one example. I think, like, every project is totally different, and um, uh, I'm, I'm really wary of um, professional standards around engagement. Like, if you, like, in urban planning, there's all these rules about, like, how you're supposed to do engagement, and I think it's nonsense because it's it's so different and there's so many different ways to do it. And, um, yeah, I agree. It's a, it's such a case by case decision. But there are you know there are a few things that you want to keep in mind. And I think one thing that, for instance, for Oakdale we discussed early on, and you can see now why, is that when we decided about a time for the first community workshop, we all thought, oh, six to eight on a weeknight is a terrible time, because no parent can come. And um, so, so there are sort of very simple uh, rules of thumb that you, in, and that, that have a huge impact of who you're actually speaking to, is where you're scheduling the meeting, who is scheduling a meeting, um, and, and when it happens, what that language? what language, that all of these things have a lot of impact on who you're actually speaking to and then who you claim is the community that you engage. So, so there's sort of careful sensitivity that I think you know, we're all aware of. Other than that, I, I also want to add in Newburgh, for instance, we um, started talking about engagement and city planners were, got immediately frustrated and they're like, no one wants to come to a planning meeting here anymore, just do something. <laughs> and so here we decided to do this lot um, as the engagement itself. So we, we, had, you know, we had one session where we got, got out on the street, made sure the neighbors know we're coming. But other than that, the place itself will be the engagement, and, and we're, you know, we're okay with failing. If people come and hate it, destroy it, um, give us bad comments about it, all of that will have to be part of the engagement too, so that it's a completely different way of going about it. Yeah, specifically Newburgh, that's a community, we, our office is in Newburgh, and we, we do quite a bit of work there. Uh, but it's a community that has, over the last 11 or 12 years, it suffered something called planning fatigue. Um, and you know, there, there comes a point where, where urban planners and regional planners, they come together and they conduct this community engagement very much by the book. And it, it's awful after a while because it's the same people that come out, they have the same reaction, and you're never really getting to the root of some of the issues. Specifically in some of these older cities where you've got urban renewal issues. Where neighborhoods were just completely ripped apart. And in order for, I mean, I'm, I'm a white male. When I walk into a community meeting like that, chances are nobody's really going to talk up. And if you understand what the history is and you accept what the history is, you've got to realize that there's a planning effort that goes along to take care of those issues. And when people had their neighborhoods and their homes just completely torn apart, it's something that happened generation, a couple generations ago, but it sticks with people. So one of the really interesting methodologies that, that I've seen 
work extremely well setting up a blackboard on a, on a street and literally leave chalk. And people walk up to the blackboard and write their ideas about what they want. There's nobody there to judge it. There's nobody there that is facilitating you know, th this sort of formal, formalized planning session. It's just what's top of mind, what comes to mind. Um, and then you take pictures at the end of the day, you jot down your notes, and you, and you move on. It's, it's, I think it's a very valuable experience. But as it, was, as it was said a few minutes ago, every community is different. And people have to understand the history of the community in order to, to I think, get, get to the root issue, barriers, challenges, and how do you overcome those issues. Yes. Yeah, um, Hudson's had a long history of brought with uh, public participation problems. Um, and it's always a problem, you know, because there's, there's, there's apathy too. At, at the moment, we're involved, we just did a uh, slam dunk winning a, you know, a response to a, a litigation against the city. And this has a lot to do with future planning in the waterfront. But this, this, uh, this litigant is going to come at us again and again and again, expecting to lose every time. And what we have is a weakness. It, it, in government, really. There's a lack of agency in local government, and that's kind of a new thing. That's where these people with their templates come in, with the planning uh, uh, companies, with their templates come in, and, and that's how the fatigue begins. Do you recognize any of these themes elsewhere, and what to do about it? The, the theme of template, yeah. Uh, there's there's certain number of consultants that have been out there for decades doing the same thing, and literally some of the plans that you see, especially in the comprehensive plans, you can see them coming off the shelf, dusting off the name, writing in a new name, and it's just it's just a formula-based planning session. There's a couple of them in in and around, um, and I'm not going to point to them. In, they've they've in been the here. Bit, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and so, you know, again, getting, getting, getting to the residents, so meeting them on their terms, going to the church basement, going to the housing authority, going to a town hall, a village hall, um, meeting people in a park, having a Saturday where you're doing what's called a small placemaking activity, where you're creating this urban, urban park from a vacant uh, property. You're going through the process, you're building trust. You're understanding what their issues are. Um, and then you're coming out with, with a plan that is literally homegrown. Because if nobody buys into it, then what do you have? You have a plan that the chances are is going to sit on the shelf. I hope that answers your question. Well, yeah, I need to talk more about the legal matter, too, because we have no idea how to respond and, and not much leadership. So they're just going to keep coming after us and after us. And, and then our plan comes out of, grows out of that side. Well, Maybe to, to reformulate it, I mean, there's, you know, there's the culture of politics and government in a place, and certainly uh, that changes in, with local elections and also attitudes. So uh, here, you know, rooting in Hudson, uh, there's been a DRI, which you, you might, you know, Joe probably knows about, but you might not, um, that's infused a lot of uh, money, leveraging private money with public dollars, uh, and also has involved some degree of what was supposed to be a community planning process to it, but maybe didn't feel so to the community itself, and that could be a lack of education or lack of leadership from the from uh, city government in terms of talking to people about what needs to happen. But in terms of like the history of place here and how we all come together and think about what Hudson is, I mean, we certainly, you know, we idealize w w the whaling past of Hudson, right, over cement, but of course cement has way more of a historical impact in the city and power. But in terms of the nostalgia we have here and what we want to think about this place, we put a little whale on our street signs because it's certainly more appealing than if we put a bag of cement there. But in a, in a way, in terms of the economic history of the city of Hudson, resource extraction is much more important to the economic development of this place with all the intended negative side that, that comes with it. Um, but here now, we're sort of struggling to, to deal with um, all the demographic things that Joe brought up. Um, and also this new energy, which, you know, to, to respond a bit to what Tim was saying, that although we are faced with this challenge in terms of a long-standing business that's been operating in the resource extraction industry, there's lots of people here now who feel they'd like to engage 
that framework in a different way. In city government, um, the government officials, especially in a town with very poor resources, tend to be pretty reactive and afraid of litigation. So it forces a type of uh, a, a reactive type of planning framework because you feel uh, if you're too aggressive in, in, in promoting home rule, which means you know our local zoning laws or things that govern the very practical side of planning in a community, uh, that desire to sort of uh, represent the people in a um, in an active and, and presumably aggressive way to the private applicant, uh, you get pushback from other people in city government because they're afraid of that intended lawsuit. So I think that gets in the way of the, the idealized planning environment. On the other side of it too, like trying to get people interested in showing up at a planning, a planning board meeting and talking about zoning, every time I say, hey, this is, this is great stuff, people's eyes glaze over because they, it's, it's, it's clearly, it tends to be in the past a very dense, um, use-based, you know, the way that we, de we deal with zoning, it's not something that people can interact and see that, you know, this is a real way that, that power um, exhibits itself in the local community, like how you structure your development laws, especially if you don't revisit them, they become these sort of artifacts from 30 or 40 years ago that are just driving um, uh, e exclusionary development, uh, people feeling left out of their own city, and certainly in Hudson, where we had an urban renewal project that gutted a good portion of the city, you have a large group of people who are structurally poor, who don't feel reflected in the, in the economic activity of Warren Street. They don't see themselves there. So the, and right now, what we're trying to deal with here is uh, stitching together that fabric again, if we can. So that's the real challenge. Anyone? Yes. Why would somebody on the city council be, af be afraid of a lawsuit? Why would they personally fear that? If they're Working for the city, the city's paying their paycheck, the city's hiring a lawyer to defend the city. Why are they afraid? It's less, it's, it's, I think it's a degree of just a lack of knowledge, you know, because we're all lay people here when you get elected to, it's not like you're a professional um, politician or a professional leader in this way. Um, and people tend to defer heavily to attorneys, so, and they think of attorneys as like scientists or something when it's just a, it's just a per one persuasive argument versus an like another one, and whoever's the more persuasive attorney is going to win out. But you take that, you know, uh, especially back to the fact if we have a very resource-starved city, um, and your attorneys say, geez, if you're too aggressive here, you know, you're going to invite a long period of litigation, and if you're spending fifty to $100,000 a year on litigation, that takes up painting your city um, crosswalks or repair, or, or someone will make that argument. So rather than saying, hey, look, you know, this type of development might have a huge, it's going to have a huge impact on our, the future of this place from a planning perspective and just a quality of life perspective, um, sometimes it's really hard to, to illustrate the relationship between those two things when someone's listening only to the opinion of an attorney and thinking about the bottom line of the city budget. So I think that's so, what that so comes down to. So is the person who is fearful in that situation just not in possession of the counter-argument? They don't understand that, you, you know, yes, we can't paint the crosswalks next year, but three years from now we're going to have a much bigger tax base. For I think that's the problem. Yeah, I think generally that's the problem with plan planning and, and long-term thinking and economic development and city planning in a small community is that relationship, you know, trying to say, Here's the immediate proximate issue, but then, hey, if you just if we wait five or ten years, it could look like this. So it's that idealized conflict with the with what what could happen in the media. As, uh, <clears throat> I've seen several small communities use the local community college to design and do planning. They learn and they show you things that you wouldn't ordinarily see. Has anyone decided to use the community college here? I think there's been. Definitely an activation more. Uh, the community college just actually um, developed a program for uh, historical preservation con uh, in the construction field, which certainly has a, um, an impact here in Hudson, but maybe people in the panel here could talk more about how local colleges, you know, Dan, uh, Dan teaches as well as, as has a firm that does work, so he's a, is a mix of this ideas-based and practical teaching, so maybe you could speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know, I don't have much to add except it sounds like a great idea. Uh, and uh, I, we, I don't know much about uh, the local college. Is it Columbia County? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I don't know really much about it, but um, that sounds like a, a really good idea. I don't know, Joe, do you have any? Or, I, I can have some. Yeah, I was going to say. 
Yeah, so, I mean, we're not a local college, obviously, <laughs> Columbia University, but, um, but we've been working with students in the Hudson Valley for a number of years, and, um, and, and so we certainly appreciate the opportunity to learn um, and, and want to give all these ideas back to the city. So last fall, we had about 50, no more, 45 urban design students that worked in Hudson and Columbia County in, in particular. We're finishing up a, a small publication that we'll send you um, so that, that it's not, you know, only in the student's portfolio, but also um, available to everyone in Hudson, these ideas. I, I want to caution, though, that these are ideas, and, and they're inspiring, and they're fun to look at, but they, you know, what we hear over and over again in this process of working with communities is that they're not, you know, they're, they don't necessarily lend themselves uh, immediately to the next step, because obviously, the students have a lot of academic freedom in, in pursuing their own uh, interests in these projects. Um, and so one reason why um, the, the Hudson Valley Initiative exists is to be able to be that link and be a link that can take a student idea or a student process and work with the community to produce a product that then you could actually use for um, a zoning change um, or a, you know, just a, a vision for a site that everyone's talking about. Um, and I wanted to come back to one earlier question um, that what we see, having done this now for a while in the Hudson Valley, is, is you, you brought this up, it's the issue of capacity, and that is just a function. I, I'd be curious to hear that talk um, about small town, you know, small town America is where it's at, right? Um, because what we see is that there is a lot of potential, um, but there's also, in terms of planning, um, a real lack of capacity, because, and it just comes with numbers, right? That you, you don't have a professional planner on staff, or other towns may have one, but you only one. Um, and so there's just limits to what you can do. I, I would just love to hear, well, I know there are other questions, but like, to get to the, back to the question of the future of Hudson, like, what, do you, what would you want to do if you had the c capacity? And I, I would love to hear, like, like we're seeing these numbers, and things are, losing population, is, it, is the goal to grow, shrink gracefully, to, uh, <laughs> to um, and, and how, how do you attract it, and, what, and how do you, because uh, to a certain extent there's a zero sum game here, because a lot, of, a lot of the people who are buying homes here are perfectly happy probably that, that it's emptied out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but if you live here, it's a different story. So I don't want to, hijacked other people's questions, but at some point, I think it would be really great yeah. to, to hear about capacity and what would you do with the capacity. Yeah, there, that, that's actually, that's actually, Sorry, we'll get that's, <laughs> that's actually a really important point, capacity. So we, we work in nine counties. So a few, a few years ago, um, the governor passed this thing called the uh, tax cap. So every year, municipalities can't raise taxes more than 2%, essentially, that's the formula. What, that, what the unintended consequence of that uh, tax cap did was it, it created these barriers for municipalities to hire professional staff. So many small communities just don't have the luxury of having a planner on staff. Um, they don't have the luxury of, of, of having a lot of professional staff um, available to them. And so you, you've, got to, you've got to balance all of that you know, as well. So whether you go out and hire you know, a consulting firm um, or you try to do things in staff, you, you have aspirational goals, you have some low-hanging fruit, and whatever's you know, sort of the low-hanging fruit, grab it, do it, um, do it well, and then keep those aspirational goals you know, alive. Um, you know, if you, if you take a look at what Columbia does, the students come out and they, they, and they do some visioning plans, it's really important to have those goals um, and, and keep them in mind, but, but take care of some of the other issues. And the other issues are those that, that the local residents and businesses bring up on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, striking that balance is just, just important. I know I keep saying that phrase, but it, it's absolutely critical. Hudson has a vision. Hold on. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. I have a question about going back to um, Incentives. I'm thinking about a lot. Of, I'm curious from the panel what cities you see are good examples of city planning creating uh, good incentives for people to come to those towns. I think a lot about um, in, 
incentives that attract businesses, but also the, the challenge of that. You know, I used to live in San Francisco, which is, I think, the most extreme version of our future of uh, structural inequality and structural racism. And uh, really, that city is, I think, a dystopia. Um, how, do we, how do we think about urban planning and who are, who are the cities doing it right? I mean, I live in Philly, which I think is moving at a rate that I think is a little more responsible. Um, curious from the panel what we think works on a larger level. Who's doing it better than Valley? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Joe, you want? I would love to hear your take on this. So just kind of, kind of summarize that question, because you had a lot in there. Just yeah, I guess I'm, I've been thinking about a lot, like, what is going to take cuts into the next level beyond the retail on Warren? And do we attract businesses here? And what is the, what do you do to do that responsibly? And is that what the town wants? Right, so the, you're talking about incentives. So you know, one, one of the most powerful tools that we've seen up and down the valley, um, and you might be pro, you might be con, it doesn't matter. There's this thing out there called the IDA, Industrial Development Agencies. And they're a very powerful tool that creates and drives incentives toward economic development. IDAs can also be used um, as a powerful tool for incentives to drive housing as well. Um, they do it in Yonkers, they do it in New Rochelle, they're bigger cities, but yet the, it is a permissible activity uh, within IDA. So that's an incentive um, that can be done. Um, there's other incentives out there. There's all sorts of different types of federal and, and state grants. Uh, the city was uh, fortunate enough to be the award winner of the Downtown Revitalization Initiative, which was $10 million, comes to the city, and it can leverage a lot of, a, a lot of really positive economic development growth. And that was an economic development engine, you know, it was created as an, as an engine for that. It's kind of an, it was an odd system, to be honest, uh, because there was an application process where you had to identify things, then you were awarded, then you had to go through the community engagement process, and then you had to get all of that approved by the, by the state. So it's a little, a little bass backwards, um, but we, you know, we, we've been working with four communities now that have DRIs, um, and uh, the, the other communities uh, outside of Hudson, they're, they're doing pretty well with it. You know, they're, they're, of course there is pros and cons, and of course there's community pushback on certain elements of projects. But overall, you've got an infusion of $10 million into a very small area, um, and, that, and that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a positive thing. I don't know if that answers your question, your question or not. Yeah, aspects. I was just curious from people on the panel, like, what other small towns you see are like, it's working in, like, I spoke of big cities, but you have more experience maybe on a smaller scale. Which, which so, cities do you like that are doing so development? I, 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 can, I can point to an example in the city of Middletown in Orange County, a city of about 25,000. So yeah, it's a little bit bigger than Hudson, but it's still considered a, a, a small city. Um, their downtown has completely come back. Um, they, of course, they've got breweries, they've got, um, they've got really nice eateries, cafes, and things of that nature. Um, but they've also got an urban trail system uh, that actually goes right through their downtown and it's being connected to another countywide system called the Heritage Trail, which is a rail to trail. And so this, this trail system will eventually go from the city of Middletown all the way to the village of Goshen and down to the, to the village of Harriman. Uh, so it's going to be about 25, 26 miles in total length. It's paved, it's flat, it's an incredible surface. So, you know, I, I would say that that type of, or, you know, it's an urban setting, but then it leads to a, a trail that's outside of the urban setting, and that's an economic development boom. It really is. People love to come and walk on the trails, and when the trail goes through the downtown, that opens up, in, you know, a lot of businesses um, <coughs> that are going to do much, much better. In fact, one of the one of the very interesting projects that they did. And they had an old J.J. Newberry's, or I'm sorry, it was Woolworth's. And they tore down the Woolworth, which was in between two large buildings in their downtown. And they conducted this, we, we wrote this, this application process called the Race for Space. And the city used $80,000 as an incentive for people to fit out space within the four walls of this building with the urban park system 
the trail going directly through. So now there's, there's going to be three businesses, one, one business to two spots and, and two other businesses to one each. Um, but that's going on right now and those businesses are going to be opening up very, very soon. So, so that takes, again, that trail system, it takes the urban redevelopment, uh, it takes an existing building and it combines it all. It's really placemaking on steroids. Can I say one, just one quick thing to add is, uh, I don't have an answer to that question, I think that was um, talking a little bit about Middletown, but I just want to say that um, my incentive, so I moved here to Tivoli from about three years ago from Brooklyn, sorry, and um, uh, my incentive was like, wow, I can live in like this historic village and like ha buy a house for not that much, have like, you know, a bunch of acres with streams and stuff and woods, and I could walk to like an amazing coffee shop in like two minutes. Like it's incredible. And I could go to Claremont every day and nobody's there. And there's no industry around and like there's no sprawl and there's all these things. So I spoke of the zero sum game before yeah. because like that's not sustainable. Like what attracted me here is like this and the things that I like about it this is that it's not developed. And so in a way in this really cruel way it's like those numbers going down like benefit me and my incentive and my vision, but I also recognize that it's like totally not sustainable. So the question is like, how, you know, I think we have something amazing here in these in these towns in this what the biggest uh, nas national historic district right in the um, in the country here in the Hudson Valley from what Hudson down to um, Rhinebeck or whatever. I mean, we we have something, and how do we how do we keep that? But also like not channel what I sometimes want to channel, which is this nimbyism, which is like, ah, it's cool, man. It's like, just keep it empty, keep Claremont <laughs> empty, like keep the crowds away, keep, and so I don't know what the answer is, and, or like, you know, keep, keep all, this, all this farmland from being developed. So I guess it's maybe smart growth is the answer. <laughs> it seems like it, but uh, how you do that, I'm not sure. Anyway, I just want to offer the, the other challenge to that, though, is with, without commercial growth and economic I'm sorry, without economic growth, where does the tax burden land? It lands on the residents. So, you know, up, up here, I think in Columbia County, you're probably paying about 60, 62% of your total tax bills for schools. You saw the numbers on school enrollment. Enrollment drops, drops, drops. What happens to the school budget? It goes up, 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 and up. And a part, of, part of that is a legacy cost because the people that retire at the schools and municipalities, you still have to pay into, into, the, uh, into the pension system. So there comes a point where the legacy costs in some communities are actually higher than current operating. So the municipality still has to cover those bills. How do you do that if you have a declining population and you don't have business coming in to share part of the burden of the tax? Eventually, the residents, they're going to be taxed out. And we're seeing that, a lot of demographic shifts People are leaving the state, and it's not because of the weather; it's because of the taxes. Uh, you get a question in the back. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Evan. I'm a small business owner here at Hudson. Um, a fascinating discussion and questions. Um, I'm wondering to what extent, right now, in urban planning, and this could apply to anybody in the assembly too, augmented reality technologies are being used to visualize what future Hudsons and uh, Woodstocks and all these other places could look like. Far out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. I never did that, but I'd love to. I'm kind of a Luddite and a little, and like a lot of stuff that we do is really analog. But yeah, I would love to learn that. I don't know. Have you ever done that stuff? I haven't done this. And I have to say, but I've researched a, a little bit a few weeks ago because it came up in another discussion. And what I found is, interestingly enough, it's being used primarily to um, in in places to sort of um, re uh, well, reawaken, let's say, history. So, so it, it allows you to bring a historic place back to life. So, so that is a, a realm where I've seen it being used quite successfully. Also, um, sort of across an entire town where you can walk through the town and see it, you know, as Shakespeare saw it. Cool. That's great. Uh, oh, um, uh, yeah, I live here in Hudson. So um, I uh, raised my daughter um, in Brooklyn, but then we moved up here, and it seems like one 
one way to encourage young people to settle here is really to make sure that there is a good school locally for people to go to. And it always feels like this unsolvable chicken and egg problem that people won't move here if the school doesn't feel adequate and then you can't attract businesses unless there's housing and people feel like they can move here and raise their kids here. So I'm not saying that there's some magic button to push, but I was just wondering if you could speak to some of any communities that you've worked with where you worked with that problem of how to increase population by encouraging younger people to move to a community. I don't know any examples, but I will say that like um, up here, like, so Tivoli's in the, sorry to keep talking about Tivoli, but I guess I know a little bit of that. It's in, it's in Red Hook, right? And Red Hook is really, I don't have kids, but apparently has a really good school system. Yet, when houses come on the market, it's not, it's, uh, in Tivoli, it's really not families who are, who are buying those houses. It's like people with disposable income who are buying these properties as weekend properties. And I know that happens a lot here in Hudson. And so, I'm not so sure that the good school, it, it's not an incentive. Uh, uh, enough, actually, at least in Tivoli, and um, that, I guess that opens up a whole other conversation. <laughs> conversation about again, what kind of growth do we want, and how do we ensure that like the uh, these the, the homes stay affordable to people who actually live here, and how do we keep Airbnb out, all that stuff. That's a whole other topic. But I just wanted to offer that as a. I don't know if you have any experience with There's that. There's so many more questions. Oh, than I yeah. Know. Well, I was just thinking about something real quick about responding to that. So, like, speaking from my experience, I'm actually visiting this weekend, mm -hmm. um, and I am, like, having a really intense emotional response to being in fresh air. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also a middle school teacher in New York City. And, you know, when I, when I hear that, I'm like, yeah, I... I would move here and teach in the schools here and revitalize the schools, but there has to be some kind of economic investment for me to, to come and purchase a home, right? Like, I am a public school teacher, so clearly I'm not earning a lot of money. I'm not at the top of the pay scale, right? So, like, how, how do you get people like me who are, like, elder millennials to come and purchase uh, property out here and actually, like, become sort of the revitalizing you know, new blood, so to speak. I think this gets back to capacity and, and also this sort of dovetails into something that uh, Joe was describing in terms of like the different the DRIs, these downtown revitalization projects that are happening there, le leveraging state uh, money with uh, private investment dollars. Hudson was rewarded one. Um, Kingston, another it's about 30 miles away, was rewarded as well. And, and there's a, um, an, an illustration that could be made between the two communities. Uh, Kingston sort of had a framework to slot in involving, a, a, you know, recent um, decent government. It also, it didn't maybe have the same type of decline problems that uh, Hudson faced uh, with the collapse of industrialization. So in the Kingston framework, they already had a lot of things slotted in that that state infusion could go with. They already had in line um, uh, uh, private sector partners, um, defined public goals. Uh, the Hudson contrast is much different. The, the community here, member, uh, private um, business stakeholders and the city really worked hard to try to achieve the DRI for the community and won, which is a good thing, but then also it sort of entered into this framework where there wasn't a legacy of recent decent government or sort of uh, capacity for planning. Um, and in that mix and the confusion, you know, it's, 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 it's arguably a very good thing. But then the, the negative sides come out where because we don't have the, it, because we're trying to build the capacity to have sustainable planning and go, good government here, at the same time all this thing is happening, it's created a lot of uh, dissension about um, who's to be rewarded, how these things are to play out in, in, in a community. And so it's an interesting contrast where you see the places that have been sort of ahead of this community in terms of thinking about decent government planning versus Hudson, which is playing catch up. But here we are with this massive, uh, for a very small place, a large fin uh, financial incentive to, you know, get our house in order. Some more questions? Oh. Hi, uh, I'm Mark Stewart, fourth board. Um, thank you, Peter, for hosting this. Thank you guys for coming out for this, and John for, for moderating. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we could spend 
whatever time we have left, or a little bit of time speaking about alternative currencies. And in particular, if you have any experience, I know years ago, I, I grew up in Kansas, in Lawrence, Kansas, where I went to college and developed a currency, a way to keep local money local. I know around the same time, just about 20 years ago, Ithaca was doing a similar thing. Um, I have a, a, as someone who's juggling kids and family and trying to not work in the city and only work here and a lot of things, um, we've started hosting artists at our house um, as an alternative form of currency so they can have space to work, not pay too much rent in Brooklyn, not move back home with their parents. And uh, something that I'm interested in, I think it speaks to also incentives and various things. Do you have any feedback around that or any experience or does that come up ever? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, some, uh, well, maybe an interesting example uh, to offer. We have um, in our team at Columbia a faculty member, her name is Gita Mehta, who uh, created a currency <coughs> called Social Capital Credit. Um, and so most of our projects are in uh, small villages in Africa and uh, India. She's eager to bring that concept to communities here um, in the United States. Um, and. The way it works is, so this is really around uh, collecting credit for doing something for the community that may be cleaning up um, a, a creek that was, you know, is full of trash. Um, you earn credits for, for spending time doing that and then you can spend those credits in the community for things that are either also sort of services that other people offer, but they also often include uh, goods that you would otherwise have to buy, like school supplies for children, um, health care in these communities is a big uh, topic that um, becomes part of this. And so uh, her organization, it's a nonprofit organization, is the, the middleman who sets that up and who sets it up really with the community working with people. So what are the things that you can offer into the system and what are the things that you most need to get out of the system? So it's been working in small places really successfully um, with an eye towards how everyone can contribute to um, public spaces or a common good. <coughs> Does Ithaca, so far, does anybody know if Ithaca still has their own currency? I'm not sure. No. Where is your new ball states of bartering system? There's a time bank, which is uh, where that concept is often called in, in the United States, uh, being formed in Hudson at this moment. So if anyone is curious about that idea, you can come talk to me. Well, I'm glad I am work. Do any more questions here? Yes. Um, I'm curious, uh, where do developers fit in in everything we've talked about today? You talked about uh, top-down <coughs> planning and bottom-up planning. Where does the developer fit in that? You mean big developers? No, developer. Uh, well, I guess I'd be curious, um, you know, back to the, the question before about uh, if you want growth, you need developers, at least now, <laughs> right? Um, while the uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, and uh, so, a big role potentially if you want growth. But is that, I'm curious, is that what, does Hudson have a plan? Is Hudson looking to attract more people? Is Hudson looking to develop? Is Hudson looking to, yeah, I guess you would know the answer to this. <laughs> and where? And what kind of housing? And but the, I mean, this gets back to uh, Joe's great points and what's, what we've been talking about. I mean, we need. Uh, people to live here um, because we certainly are stressing the uh, property hold, uh, t tax holder base here in terms of uh, property tax uh, base and residential uh, um, base is it's deeply stressed to provide limited resources here right so taxes are increasing school taxes municipal taxes and the what what's being the the, the amenities um, although it's you know it's difficult to talk about government services in the way that you talk about consumptive goods, but people tend to think of them that way. What we're, what we're providing is, is pretty poor, and, and we need to attract people to, who want to live here full time rather than have second homes. Um, second home owners still are beneficial because they're paying property tax on that home, but it doesn't do the, the generative community building that you, know, you sort of seek in, in, in a place. So that's the real um, 
dilemma we face here in a community because in, in you do need what uh, developer is a broad based term but if someone comes in and says I have a plan for X um, and you know they they could convince uh, the city and stakeholders that the plan is good and it's going to generate jobs then you know you gamble on it because you, you hope that it has some sort of long-term uh, positive impact rather than a ver uh, something that's planned in a vacuum and doesn't really interact with the community so I mean, personally, uh, being involved in city government, I think my, my goal in my tenure would be to try to increase the possibility that for us to grow back a population that's more sustainable here. Um, because certainly uh, we're on a glide path toward unsustainability and we'll further, if we further erode our population base, you know, all of this planning talk will essentially go out the window. I'm just curious, uh, Kind of a big question, but maybe a nice note to land on uh, with some open reflections on what is a useful horizon for, we're talking about the future of, you know, how far out do you look and think and speak to, um, and what kinds of age demographics do you include in, in different kinds of planning work when you have a Gen Z coming out that, if they're lucky, get to see the 22nd century. You know, um, and at the rate of change, there were accelerating rates of change and kind of looming, unpredictable impacts, things like climate. Uh, I don't know, how does that fit in neatly to the kind of work and, and just you know, personal thought and kind of imaginal space that you include in, in these kinds of conversations and processes? If we had Pete Buttigieg here, he would, <laughs> he would knock that one out of the park. Uh, yeah. <laughs> do you want to? So the little one has been coming in and out, just uh, attended a few weeks ago her first climate strike. And um, I think we have 11 years. <laughs> so that's, the, I'm sorry. I didn't expect to get emotional. We have 11 years. That's a very short horizon that I think we have to plan for and really make um, drastic changes. And so um, at least in educating urban design students, that is uh, what, what we focus on, that in order to prevent um, a global warming beyond um, 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius, um, we really need to drastically rethink the way we um, use our land, the way we move. Every time I come here, I am shocked that in such a small town, no one walks or uses a bicycle. Um, and I don't see electric vehicles anywhere. Um, so we, the horizon for planning, um, if we want to take that generation serious, is very short. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the comprehensive plan is an extremely valuable tool. I think the last plan was in 96? No, 17, no. 2002. Two, oh, two, okay. It's still ancient. Oh, two. Um, and that's the, and those those are ten year horizons. So to ask how far do you want to plan out, they typically go ten. Years. They shouldn't go more than ten years. Um, Newburgh did one in '08. They're doing one now in '18. Um, other communities, their comp plans go back to the late '60s, early '70s. Um, they're really behind times. Uh, so it's a useful process and a very useful tool. Uh, we do have electric vehicle charging stations coming to Hudson now through the efforts of some people on the council. Vision plan is 96. Thank uh, you. Carla? Okay, me? Yeah. Okay, hi, Charlotte Jensen, also a resident or half resident, or maybe not a wanted resident. I weekend here as well, but I do love living here, and I think I see myself gradually moving up here. And I really just fell in love with the community. I'm, I get very upset when I just see numbers. I get, I want to curse, I get very angry because we're not just numbers. I mean, it just takes one or two people to change something. It takes you guys to come together and to want to talk about things. And all we see is numbers. And that really bothers me, you know, that we don't see it. Like, if, if somebody really has an idea and wants to do something, honestly, like, I've done things in communities, every time I get whacked on the head, you know? And so I think that there's, there's really a, a difficulty to say, okay, what are we going to do? But when people want to do something, they get kicked in the ass, you know? And so I really think that there's a lot of times when people say, oh, 
this is the bad actor, that is the bad actor. It's, it's not one thing. It, every system sees an opportunity, every market sees an opportunity, and there are good and there are bad actors. And I think what we have to do is, we have to s differentiate between the good and the bad actors rather than say, oh, this is the culprit. Or, that's a witch hunt, or I mean, we shouldn't even use that word. I mean, that, that's a way to oversimplify the issue. Like for instance, you know, we don't, there's something we don't talk about here, is that there's, there are people warehousing buildings here. There are big holdings holding onto these buildings. We're individuals all trying to make ends meet, make things work, and, and you know, some get demonized, some not. But in reality, there's someone holding onto a lot of buildings in here that are not being developed, and because they're a nonprofit, they're getting a giant tax break. So we're, we're paying for the bill, and they're not even creating space for others to live. And it's pitting people against each other. And that's really upsetting me that we don't talk about that. Well, you know? I think we do talk about it. The unfortunate thing is with non-for-profits, and uh, is that's you know governed by the New York State Constitution and tax law. So now that they're here, it's next impossible to to evict a non-for-profit. You could go after their charter, um, but if they could demonstrate some sort of public utility to what they're doing, even if it's very uh, modest, uh, that's all they need to do to have protection under that. So that's part of a. You know, there's definitely some things that need to happen um, nationally and on the state level in terms of uh, how our tax policies work um, in, uh, in municipalities and states, the types of protections that are given for non-for-profits to exist in a community. Because certainly in Hudson, um, uh, where we have a high relatively high concentration of non-for-profits, what that does to our tax base is, is pretty drastic. Um, so, uh, you know, it, that's a tough conversation here because Certainly, like what's happening in this room is, is generative. We're all here to sort of talk about what planning can be, what this community can be, um, and yet there there are things that, that you're describing that are very real. And um, I mean, they, it feels immov immovable. Does, doesn't mean that uh, we'll come up with. Doesn't mean that there's no solution for it. But in the near term, it's a, it's a very hard thing to deal with. So, vacant building registry. Uh, the city of uh, Philadelphia, the city of uh, Baltimore, Baltimore, they have created extremely uh, sophisticated vacant building registries and fees associated with vacant buildings. So the developer, yeah. developer has something that's vacant, you a certain time frame, you do something. If they don't, the city starts fining them. Substantial fines. One of the, one of the fines that they created, I think it was, this one was in Baltimore, it was, um, they didn't want to see buildings that are boarded up, so they were fined per opening. Uh, so if there were the typical townhouse or, or, or brownstone down there, it's two windows, two windows, a window and a door, six openings, $300 per opening per month. That was a fine. And so you can establish those things. It's, it, it, it's, it's within the city's purview, but it's, it's not an easy thing to police and strong code enforcement, it, it's very, very valuable. Yes. Yes. Uh, you, mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned Red Hook. Uh, if I draw a circle around Hudson that includes Red Hook, I've seen in the real estate sales books, the things that are available to buy, over half a dozen homes for more than $10 million apiece. Why isn't that money fueling this part of the world? I mean, that's... Yeah, that, you probably know more about this than I do. I don't know, I wonder that. 17 million for a house in Red Hook. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's... it's I, I, just, I, I think the, the problem, like that phenomenon is such a... It, it's, it's complex, you know, because I mean, it's, it's certainly... Uh, real estate is a big driver in the national economy, like the way that we... And, uh, it's a store of wealth, um, but it also could escape normal ways that we access that money because you know the way that someone uses a home sale could be for capital gains and we don't look at capital gains the same way we look at his normal income it gets a more preferential uh, tax treatment and you know it, until hopefully there's a, a movement afoot that's going to sort of change that that framework in terms of how we access that type of wealth and redistribute it because we, we clearly have to it's no longer a question of you know is uh, this ideological battle between socialism and capitalism. I mean, it's, it's a clear problem if, uh, for wealth distortion. Like if someone, I heard it on the radio the other day, but someone said, you know, in the, in the current um, presidential campaign and with the you know, 20 or so Democrats who are running for office, like who's going to frame the question, 
what's your plan to deal with the, um, you know, uh, ending the second Gilded Age? I mean, because clearly that's what we're in. And having uh, homes for sale for $17 million or whatever, or $10 million in an area where, as Joe pointed out, there are people are earning, large numbers of people are earning $23,000 a year tops, or people in Section 8 housing, it's, it's, it's a problem. You know, and I don't... And in the driveway, you see the Tesla in the satellite. Mm -hmm. well, uh, yes, you. I, I, I don't have a question that's as sexy as everybody else's, but you know, every day, if I go to Lowe's in this town, I'm in Greenport, technically. So I'm wondering, how does Hudson interface with Greenport? I mean, we seem to, there's a lot of businesses there. There's a lot of traffic back and forth. I, I think sometimes we get so Hudson-centric that we forget that we're side by side with Greenport, and we might as well be in New Jersey where you're not sure if you're in one town or another. Well, I mean, the main, the main difference is Greenport has no land use or zoning policy, except for what they take from you know, state land use laws, but they don't have their own zoning ordinances where we have a pretty uh, active um, uh, zoning laws and also a conversation about zoning, which really doesn't exist there. So, yeah, Hudson's uh, unique in this, maybe in the area where we're a two square mile community surrounded by a very large uh, geographic area that um, sort of dominates uh, our, the physical landscape. And then also the fact that they do land use very different than, differently than we do um, creates the sprawl on Fairview, uh, exacerbates a lot of immediate problems, but then also we do benefit somewhat from the, the shops that are there, right? So we, um, we've, that problem's exported beyond our borders and therefore we could interact with it, but we also know that's something that's problematic as well. So, yeah, and, and, and then the other large elephant, of course, like the, the state truck route, which comes right through Hudson and, you know, it goes back to what Tim was talking about, which, you know, um, it could be, um, it's creating uh, decades of problems here. And then, like, how does the city of Hudson uh, relieve itself of the truck burden, well, that uh, takes a conversation with other communities that then have to agree to take all of the truck traffic that we've been taking for, since the 1930s, right? And that conversation, you can imagine how hard that's going to be in terms of getting those people to agree to, sure, we'll take your, we'll take the burden that's been coming through your community and, and really ruining the lives of lots of people who are already stressed, you know, economically. Uh, so it's complex, yeah, what, what but the main thing, you know, again, this goes back, you know, it's this American thing of localism, which is a, a tradition that we've inherited from, from the English and, and the sort of home rule and, and, and local, local rule as, is a positive, but also has a lot of negatives. Because if, if you could think uh, and collectively and more broadly, regionally, and move into robust regional planning, you could maybe do away with a lot of that. But the, it, that, that's, again, that's another cultural artifact that we have to, have to struggle with. Any more questions? I, I don't know what the sales tax formula is in in, um, in Hudson and in, in the county, but what if you were a resident of Hudson and a property owner in Hudson, and you bought something at Lowe's? That sales tax comes back to the city. Just yeah. just a thought. No. Right. Yeah. Don't know. No, yeah. it's, it's it's part of the, uh, zip code. By the county. Zip code. Oh, by zip code. Yeah. More questions there. Oh, uh, just because I know we're winding it down, I'm just curious um, if there's a, a way we can start to translate, and I don't know if this is something Peter's planning to do, how can we as a community, as a city with a charter that has a common council, how can we translate our vision into, and, and some of these needs, into legislative governance immediately, and just a little bit of context. Um, I did actually walk here. I own an electric car. We recently sold our house, not on the open market, and we were able to handpick a couple that's living here full time. They quit their jobs in corporate America, and they're opening a bakery, not an art gallery. So I do believe you have to put your money where your mouth is. I sat at a meeting a couple blocks over with a proposal for the redevelopment of our public housing that had no solar panels, no parking, no plan for wastewater management. None of the things that you would think meet that, even that 10 year timeline. So how can we as a community translate some vision into a governing principle quickly? Well, this quickly. is happening here. I mean, the, the community engagement in, the, in that uh, project uh, worked. You know, the fact that people w were very active immediately in being engaged put a stop to something that, uh, or, or at least put a pause 
to something that's uh, rad radically uh, will, will transform how we do uh, how we thought about public housing here, which has been happening in one one way for 40 years, and suddenly this proposal upends it. So at least you know the act activism put a stop to that or, or put a pause. In terms of legislative outcomes, this gets back to capacity again, which I think is uh, has been the underlying uh, like the background radiation to this whole uh, conversation about what you can do with planning. I think we have to radically think of things as generally from the community, but then also take any innovative ideas of it coming down to, is the idea of a mayor even useful any longer in a community of 6,000 people where you could transition maybe toward a planning system where you remove department heads in favor of a professionalized, depoliticized planning load. All these types of things should be on the, on the table in terms of efficiencies and outcomes and things to take away um, the the hurt, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the jerky way and onto which uh, like planning and government sort of operated here. It doesn't necessarily mean that you jump forward immediately, but having these any types of ideas that approach a new way of doing things um, is very important. Just a quick thing that's what I, I suspect, I don't know the specifics of that project, but I suspect one of the reasons there's no solar panels and all these other things is because it's incredibly expensive and the public sector has just been completely decimated. So the reason why we need developers to build anything, it's the reason why we have a lot of this affordability. It's a big, the, uh, we used to have public housing, I mean, and, um, and we don't, the federal government doesn't build housing anymore, right? We, we're not gonna solve any of these problems without massive re recommitment to housing from the, from the federal government, I think. There's no way that a locality can, can build its way out of these problems. Um, it's just, and so we really, I, and in New York uh, City, I mean, it's, it, even New York City can't, can't, can't move the needle on affordability. It's, we need massive, massive commitment from the federal, from the federal government the way we once had to, to, to building housing and to providing the things that we know we need but that are not profitable, like solar panels and all these things. So, to get on a soapbox, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a there's a uh, there's a, a, a project a, a residential development project uh, that serves uh, low-income families down in the town of Newburgh. It's called Mason's Ridge, and they put up solar panels. They cut 20 percent, I believe, off of their off of their overall uh, utility costs. I have another example, Energy Square in Kingston. Yes, you Kingston, probably know absolutely. this also will be a net zero, zero affordable zero. housing building. But in that, you know, this sort of listing other examples brings me to a point back to your earlier question about, you know, Hudson versus Greenport. Um, what I've been hearing a lot in the past year and a half that I've been working in the Hudson Valley is this need or interest in uh, more collaboration and networking and and learning from each other um, across the region, and I think you can probably also speak to this, that this idea of home rule and, and, and all these little towns competing for funds um, and capacity and, and, and uh, residents isn't really helping and a sort of larger regional framework um, and collaborating uh, between, you know, amongst communities would probably be um, much more useful for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I was just going to say, in, in, um, in October, we're actually going to be releasing a regional study. Uh, Columbia and Green are part of that. Th those are the seven counties I actually showed. Um, and a lot of the recommendations for in, in this study that we're, we're producing is going to be for the Hudson Valley to actually act as a region instead of stop, start, you know, you, you can't compete with each other. If you've, if you've got great assets in one community, then utilize that and leverage that in other communities. Get you know, knock, knock down the silos. Mm, yeah, good point. Uh, let's get Tim, and then we'll wrap it up. When, uh, when Massachusetts got rid of most of its counties, was there kind of a shift towards something more regional? Do you know anything about that? Uh, a little bit, but not really. The, the only the only real regional governance you have here is actually on the West Coast, like out in you know in Portland and stuff. The problem is that most, like New York has regional planning, but it's all just people with good ideas. It, it, and yeah, they come up against home rule. Um, I mean, and this is especially true in, in work that we've done around like resiliency building and thinking about how to, like worked on a project for years in, on Long Island and looking at how to um, 
make it so that the next storm doesn't mess it up as much as Sandy does. And it's, it's impossible because, you know, the waters don't stop at municipal lines, but the rules about water do. And so it's, it, it's incredibly frustrating, incredibly hard to, to um, do anything at a regional scale. These problems are regional, but these issues, but the, but the way we govern isn't. Um, keep county government, that's the idea. Keep, keep the county government. Yeah, and, and even more than keep metropolitan governments, I think, it is, is the key. Yeah, Michael. I just don't want to be yeah. sensitive to time. Yes. We're kind of at 6 o'clock. But you mentioned comprehensive plan, and Future Hudson sort of built on this assumption that Hudson suffers because we don't have a shared vision. The comprehensive plan is from 2002. I've heard the vision plan be referenced, and that's from 1996. So I guess I just want to hear you guys describe I guess, you know, the degree to which a shared vision is actually functional and useful for a community like Hudson and you know, the role that a comprehensive plan could play in helping a community kind of try to address these kind of issues. Anybody? Uh, do I? Sure. Okay. Um, so, so the comprehensive plan is the, it, it, it sets your foundation. It creates a baseline of where you are um, and through the community engagement process it is going to create goals, visions, strategies, and most important in a comprehensive plan is to set up action steps and, a, and point to people and parties and agencies that are responsible with a timeline of getting it done. A firm that comes in and puts in aspirational goals of we want to create 30-story buildings down on the water, you know, it might sound good to some, but Look at projects and, and goals that can get accomplished. Aspirational, yeah, it's nice to see, but you've got to get it done. And it should be a plan that lasts 10 years. It should take about a year and a half to get through the, the analysis. I, yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think that the, the process of, Think of the comprehensive plan also as a process, that the, and that's the most important part, if there's sort of a process attached to it to, to work together and share ideas and, and rub them against each other. Um, but it's not helpful if then you have, after a year and a half, um, a document, and then that's a document until 10 years pass, and then you make a new one. So, so what are the steps to realize, if not the grand vision, at least portions of it in those 10 years? And keep in mind capacity as you create this. this uh, yeah, so this is the only thing I would add. It's just that it's, uh, I agree with everything that's been said. One of the problems is that comprehensive plans are really broad and big and have big ideas. And uh, they take a long time to be implemented. And a lot of the planning fatigue that you get is people sort of not, I don't want to say not understanding. It sounds so patronizing in some ways. But that, that, that change takes time, right? That, that I think. There are a lot of plans that sit on the shelf, but um, sometimes they need to, I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, a 20-year horizon for a lot of these plans, and um, in my experience, it's been um, frustrating to hear people not wanting to participate planning, because they said, well, I went to a meeting last week, and, um, and nothing, nothing, nothing got done, right? But obviously, like, the comp plans are big, they're bold, they, they're not always bold, but they're, they're uh, the ideas that typically come out of them take a really long time to, to, to implement. Um, I know, that's all. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, just uh, an anecdotal note about our last comprehensive plan. It was written by a service firm that was also working for the um, St. Lawrence Cement Company and the large development at the same time that it happened. So it takes community engagement to make sure that the firms that we decide to work with and for a consultancy basis or however we're trying to think about our community, what is Hudson, future Hudson, the sustained engagement, people like you and people in this room, is what's going to make the difference. Otherwise, we do end up with, you know, the, the, the Adams for Peace type proposal, you know, so, uh, you know, so thank you for being here and, uh, you know, this is a good first start.